does it bother you that that your dad's name isn't on anything here in Waco, or are you kind of you're not you know, worried about it? No, I I'm not consumed by that. I'd be thrilled to see a street or a plaque or something like that because of the, the enormity of his contribution. But I also understand that you know that's not always come to pass. I don't need that for validation. Mm -hmm. um, I I know the score. Um, I want my dad in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I'm a little more miffed about that. Mm -hmm. I see these pretenders and wannabes get in there year after year. And I think of, see, if you had one of the groups that my dad had, if you just did the four, taking Bob Dylan electric mm -hmm. um, and having one of the bards of our era become as prominent as he was and kind of lifting him above the beatnik beat generation where he was, um, and having become a transcendent superstar and having one of the songs that you produce be judged by Rolling Stone to be the greatest rock song of all time. Um, those who I would think would be get you into the Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. I mean, now you couple that with Eric Burden and the Animals, Simon and Garfunkel, John Coltrane, Thelonious Monk, Hugh Masekela, Sarah Vaughn, um, throw the theme from Batman on top for a cherry. Mm -hmm. um, when you're producing these type of things and they're across such a, bri a broad spectrum, the Clancy Brothers, an Irish folk band, the Chieftains, Lou Reed, when you talk about all these different things and this rainbow of artists that have impacted our world so dramatically, um, that to me speaks toward the tunnel vision and the myopia of the people who are making uh, decisions on that. I'm not expecting Waco to be, you know, uh, uh, conversant in that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I'd be, I'd be more than thrilled if they were, and would love to be a participant in it. But to speak frankly, it, it there, there's no, it, it's by no fault of theirs that they're kind of um, oblivious to it. Loud and Rogue Media Network, this is Invisible Icon, the Tom Wilson story. I'm your host, Travis Scott, and on the previous three episodes, we saw Tom's hands meticulously involved in three future Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductees. In this episode, we see the final pillar of the Music Factory years finally erected. A group that would inspire an incalculable amount of musicians to pick up an instrument and create a group whose name alone evokes a visceral experience and image due in part to the teaming up with the most famous pop artist of all time, Andy Warhol. A group that would rightfully be on top of the list of countless greatest bands of all time, greatest albums of all time, and whose leader Lou Reed would top countless greatest songwriters of all time. That group is, of course, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductee, the Velvet Underground. The year is 1964. A young Lou Reed has found himself working at Pickwick Records, writing songs for other acts. He would occasionally be commissioned to write and sing sound-alike songs under various named bands in an attempt to capture some of the same success as a song he was quasi-parroting. Mostly unknown songs such as Cycle Annie by the Beach Nuts. You'd better watch out for the little cycle Annie. Watch out for the little cycle Annie. Watch out for the little cycle Annie. And You're Driving Me Insane. 
by the Roughnecks. The songs never made any critical success, but did put Lou Reed on a trajectory to intersect with another founding member of the Velvet Underground, John Cale. The two would hook up and create a few singles under the moniker, The Primitives. One single was called The Ostrich. which was a thumbing of the nose to various hit songs that were popular in the 50s and 60s in which the singer would exclusively sing about a random dance move and the listeners are expected to, in lockstep unison, perform the dance moves the singer is commanding. Think the Harlem Shuffle, Twist and Shout, or the more modern classic, the Cha-Cha Slide. The Ostrich was Lou Reed's artistic attempt to say to his listeners that if you do everything you're instructed without critically thinking, you're not living your own life. He instructs everyone to put their heads on the floor, put their hands on their knees, and put their feet on their heads. Lou would also tune all the strings to D tuning, which he called ostrich tuning, which gave the strings a sort of droning sound. It's clear that with The Ostrich, these two are out of their minds bored, and it has become evident that they should not be creating sound-alike songs. They soon leave Pickwick Records, and with their high art brilliance, form a group called The Warlocks with a Reed College friend, Sterling Morrison, and Angus McLeese, tap to play the drums. Shortly after, they finally land on The Velvet Underground. They borrowed the name from a CD paperback novel by Michael Lee of the same name. The book was about the underground sexual subculture in the slowly awakening, but mostly prudish, early 60s. The group felt it was evocative of underground cinema, you can almost hear Andy Warhol's ears perk up. By 1965, the group had replaced McLeese for the little sister of Sterling Morrison's childhood friend. Maureen, Mo Tucker, would have been a rare sight as a female drummer during this time, and she also had an unorthodox drumming style. She played standing up, and with a minimal drum kit of tom, snare, and an upturned kick drum, no drumsticks, only mallets, and no cymbals. She believed that the job of the drummer was to keep time and cymbals just drowned out other musicians. Say what you will of her minimal style, but Mo Tucker is considered by many to be the godmother of the punk rhythm and would be impressively high on several top 100 greatest drummers of all time lists. The four-piece group played gigs around the New York City area, but iconic success isn't achieved until Warhol gets involved as their manager that same year. At the request of Warhol, the once German model and ghostly baritone singer-songwriter Nico is brought in to take on some of the lead singing. Here, the Velvet Underground is fully formed, and here they will begin their journey toward greatness, where Tom is waiting. Fast forward to 1966. With the push and reputation of Andy Warhol, the Velvet Underground would record the bulk of their debut album, 
The Velvet Underground and Nico, and a rundown studio called Spencer Studios, with Warhol splitting the recording tab with Columbia Records sales executive Norman Dolph. It is Dolph that would shop the record around to multiple labels. Columbia, Atlantic, and Elektra gave a resounding no thanks. It's not until the MGM-owned Verve Records catches wind of this that the idea of refining the record using a music man is floated. He was a lot of things, but a music producer Warhol was not. But his view of the band was the earliest idea of what art rock could be. Hey white boy, what you doing uptown? Hey white boy, you chasing all women around? Oh, pardon me, sir. It's furthest from my mind I'm just looking forward to dear friend of mine I'm waiting for my man he comes What the record needed was a producer steeped in handling a project that has the kind of potential where decades later it would be referred to as the most prophetic album of all time. Enter our friend, Tom Wilson. So, you know, uh, Lewis, I've often wondered, how, how did this whole thing start? I mean, you've been uh, in a welter of names that uh, float around in a mystical sort of way in the American scene. Uh, Nico has been wedded with the name Velvet Underground, and is now divorced from that same name. Andy Warhol has done covers for you, has figured prominently in your work. You have John here, who is a, a Welchman in the group. Uh, you have a Drama, who is a secret and a mystery. So w what happened? Where did it all start? Well, we just met down in the village where I was doing songwriting for a... Uh, a company, they would put us in a room and say, write 10 California songs, 10 Detroit songs. And John walked in, and we decided uh, it'd be much better to go play and have fun. So we started playing, and everybody had to meet everybody else. It, it was natural. So you and John were the original members then? Yeah. Where'd you find Sterling? I met him on the subway. I hadn't seen him in three years. <laughs> and he didn't have any shoes on. And I had boots on. And uh, we took him home. And what about Mo? We needed an amplifier. And she had one. Plus, she's an outside drummer. She used to sit, she would work for IBM. And when she'd come home at night, like 5, she'd put on Bo Diddley records and like play every night from 5 to 12. So we figured she'd be the perfect drummer, and she was. Well, she has great time. You know, I wasn't going to reveal the secret. I was going to leave that up to you. I think this is the only girl drummer with a major pop music group uh, in the whole scene, uh, so far as Europe and America are concerned. And uh, like most things that we found out don't matter, sex doesn't matter anymore so far as musicianship is concerned and so far as the love for playing groovy music is concerned. I'd second that. The Velvet Underground would sign a record deal with Verve Records. They'll be brought back into the studio to re-record three of the album's songs under the careful hands of Tom Wilson in May of that year. The album release date would be postponed until early 1967, so with the additional time, Tom would summon the band back to record a new song called Sunday Morning. The song had a significant contrast to the rest of the album's songs, having a more polished sound but it is one of the greatest intro songs on any album. Watch out, the world's behind you. There's always someone around you who will call. It's nothing at all. 
Tom would not officially be credited as the album's producer, only Andy Warhol was. But according to Lou Reed and John Cale, Tom Wilson was the real producer. Lou is quoted some years later when asked about the production of Sunday Morning. Andy absorbed all the flack. Then MGM said they wanted to bring in a real producer, Tom Wilson. So that's how you got Sunday Morning. With all those overdubs, the viola in the back, Nico chanting, but he couldn't undo what had already been done. The Velvet Underground and Nico album is an absolute masterpiece and a work of art due in large part to the capacity of Tom Wilson, although not immediately recognized as such due to his controversial songs and subject matter. It was painfully ahead of its time, and so was Tom, but more on that argument later. After the album's release, the Velvet Underground would part ways with Andy Warhol and Nico, and the band would move in a more commercial direction. The band and Warhol had escalating tensions over the iconic artwork on the album's cover that resulted in a lawsuit that lasted all the way until 2013. Before working with the Velvet Underground's follow-up album, White Light, White Heat, Tom worked with Nico on her solo debut album, Chelsea Girl. The album was named after a 1966 Warhol film of the same name that Nico starred in. The album would include some members of the Velvet Underground, as well as fellow Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductee Jackson Brown taking on guitars and writing perhaps the most iconic song from the album, These Days. I don't do too much talking these days. The, things that I forgot to do. And the... the album didn't receive critical success until many years later, again, because it was ahead of its time. Nico would have a very strong opposite reaction to Tom's production vision of the album. Commercials for the album were peppered throughout Tom's radio show, The Music Factory. Nico is beautiful, and in a world where so much can be so easily possessed under whim or for a promise, she's unpossessable. At Verve, we feel lucky we've isolated her long enough to record an album. Here's the fairest of the seasons. Now that it's time, now that the hour hand is landed at the end, now that it's real, now that the dream the album's called Nico Chelsea Girl, a precious girl from many dimensions. And at Verve, we love her. So only one record to a customer, we don't want to spoil Nico. We like her just the way she is. That I be leaving in the fairest of the seasons. Nico wanted a more simple sound, but Tom had other ideas for the album. She would later say that she hated it and couldn't even listen to it because of the flutes and strings Tom would dub over. However you feel about Nico's interpretation of the album, she would not have a more successful album than Chelsea Girl. But perhaps her other albums just need more time to be properly understood. Nico would continue to create albums and would tour the world until she tragically dies in a bike accident at the age of 49 while vacationing in the Mediterranean island of Ibiza. At Nico's funeral, her grieving friends and family would play the song Mutterlein from her 1970 album Desert Shore. Sung in German, the opening lines translate to Dear Little Mother, Now I may finally be with you. The longing and the loneliness redeem themselves in blessedness. Liebes kleines Mütterlein, nun darf ich endlich bei dir sein. Die Sehnsucht und die Einsamkeit erlösen sich in Seligkeit.
1968, the Velvet Underground and Tom Wilson would head back to the recording studio to churn out their second work together. White Light, White Heat would be a stark contrast to the more polished The Velvet Underground and Nico album. It's said that the main concept of the album was to present that very thing, to show a conscious anti-beauty. But much like their other albums, the album would showcase socially transgressive lyrical themes and avant-garde instrumentation that proved challenging for the popular music sensibilities at the time. Once more, their release is immediately met with minimal critical success. One positive review at the time, from critic Tim Souster of The Listener, said of Tom, Congratulations to the producer Tom Wilson for having got onto a record a very credible replica of a pop group's live sound. I've never before heard the aura of high frequencies and distortion which binds the sound together into a single phenomenon coming out of a gramophone record. The Velvet Underground and Tom Wilson will not work together again, but Tom knows his job with the band is over for a reason. They are ready to go on to bigger and better things as artists, most notably Lou Reed and John Cale. John will be kicked out of the band shortly after, but in 1969, he is tapped to arrange the debut album of punk rock godfathers, The Stooges, fronted by James Newell Osterberg Jr., or as he is better known, Icky Pop. Lou would go on to record dozens of albums, with Transformer being the best received going gold in Italy, France, and Australia, and Platinum in the UK. The Velvet Underground would be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1996, and Lou Reed would be posthumously inducted as a solo artist in 2015. In October of 2013, soon after receiving a liver transplant, Lewis Allen Reed succumbs to liver disease at the age of 71 at his upstate New York home. Our executive producers Jacob Green and Katie Salmon were living in New York City at the time, and here's Jacob recounting when he first heard the news. So this uh, particular episode is very special and important to me. Um, I'm a huge, huge Velvet Underground fan and also, by proxy, a Lou Reed fan. And uh, when, when he passed, Katie and I were uh, living in New York City at the time. We were actually watching a Dallas Cowboys game at a sports bar when the news came through. And uh, after, you know, checking to make sure this is not some cruel joke, I... Uh, confirmed it and it, it it I was battling tears almost instantly once I found that out and uh, I finally just had to give in and uh, I, I wept there <laughs> as the Dallas Cowboys and Giants fans were yelling cursing at each other uh, and I just slowly cried into my beer and uh, other than David Bowie I've, I've never felt that kind of like sadness over someone I really didn't personally know but um intimately i felt like i did know through through his music and once i found out that tom wilson had produced um and had a major hand in both their first albums the velvet underground i i was just hooked instantly to this project and i i just wanted to be a part of it I think it's worth taking another moment to reflect on 
the injustice of Tom Wilson Jr.'s absence from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Uh, at this point, we've laid out four pillars of greatness. And, you know, based solely on the fact that he continues to showcase his flexibility and nimbleness um, and his ability to make the right adjustments on a struggling concept, and then to turn that concept into a masterpiece, uh, not just once, but on several occasions, should, at minimum, put him in the same conversation as the other producers in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I think it is also worth noting that the positive review from critic Tim Souster, I'm not sure is a compliment. Still trying to piece that one together. next episode of Invisible Icon, The Tom Wilson Story, we sit down with Tom's son and grandson to talk about the legacy of Tom Jr. and what they hope people will remember him for. This podcast is produced by Rogue Media Network. Our executive producers are Lindsay Lippman, Zach Burke, Jacob Green, and Katie Selman. Our director is Mike Hamilton. A special thank you to our voice actors for today's episode, producer Mike and executive producer Jacob Green. Our theme music is by the Bowleys. Join us for the next installment of Invisible Icon, The Tom Wilson Story. This has been a Rogue Media Network podcast.